can't buy It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a beach If you find the same And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have Scott Scully of Abstract Marketing Group. You could check it out at Abstract. That's with a KMG.com. And Scott, before I formally introduce you, I'm going to mention a couple episodes people should check out of the podcast. And since you have an amazing, growing, thriving team, and we'll talk a little bit about, you, you focus a lot about how do you retain A players and how do you attract A players? There was an interview I did with Chris Mersau, who's the CEO of Top Grading. And uh, that's what they talk about. Uh, how do you attract and um, retain A players? And, you know, people have heard of the book. So check out the interview I did with Chris. Also, um, I did an interview with Todd Tasky, who helps um, connect agencies to private equity when they're ready to sell. And he has a second bite podcast. It's a great podcast. And we'll be talking about acquisitions on this with Scott as well. So that's an appropriate interview to check out with Todd Tasky. We'll also talk about niches. You know, Scott has been a master of going into different niches. And um, I had Duncan Alneon who um, started Firebelly Marketing and he really focused on the food and beverage space and niche down in that. So um, before we get into it, this episode is brought to you by Rise25. At Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships. And how do we do that? We help you run your podcast. We're an easy button for a company to launch and run a podcast. We do accountability, strategy, and full execution of a podcast. And for me, you know, Scott, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. So I'm looking forward to hearing your sales uh, enablement approach. Um, but I found no better way to do that than to profile the people and companies I most admire and profile them and shout from the rooftops and let the world know what they're working on. So if you've thought about starting a podcast, you should. If you have questions, go to rise25.com. Happy to answer them. And uh, I want to formally introduce Scott Scully, CEO of Abstract Marketing Group. He started investing in several companies over the past 28 years. And his main focus has been in the marketing and lead generation space with three companies exceeding $12 million in annual revenue. And his current venture, Abstract Marketing Group, has grown by a minimum of 20% over for the last 12 years straight. And they surpassed over $50 million in revenue in 2021, and they're still growing. And he attributes his success, which we'll dig into, to niche focus, great team members and business partners, sound processes and innovative workplace culture. So Scott, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to it. So just tell people a little bit about Abstract Marketing Group and what you do. Yeah, Abstract Marketing Group, uh, we're in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, we work in every state. Uh, we've got about 2,000 clients. And the best way to look at us is really outsourced sales enablement. You know, so we do that, that hard work that maybe someone doesn't know how to do, or maybe they don't want to do it. And it's all about us helping people uh, build a predictable sales pipeline. So we'll do everything from, you know, building a website and creating content to, to connecting on social to really the biggest piece of what we do is, uh, email marketing, and then phone outreach. So we've got a couple hundred people actually on the phone working on behalf of our clients, uh, you know, finding that decision maker and setting up that first sales call. So that's, that's really the, the way that I would look at us as an, an outsourced sales enablement team. We're going to walk through your company and what you actually do, because you eat your own dog food with this. But okay. let's go back to the days when you were on the phone and um, I think you said you hated the appointment setting, you liked the actual calls and you would have a goal of doing a hundred outbound calls a week, right? So what was your, um, 
what was your goal at the time? What do you recommend companies out there when they're like, we want to book more appointments? What's the amount of calls they have to do to appointments they want to set up? Well, it was, it was actually more than, uh, more than a hundred a week. It was a hundred a day, a hundred a day. Uh, sorry. It was. We, the people that are doing, uh, just the phone call piece for us actually make 135 a day, which is about 17 and change an hour. Uh, I think that it really depends on uh, what phase of the sales process you're in. You have to, to understand that when we're running through our sales enablement process, a big part of that outreach may be cleansing and determining whether or not a company is actually a fit before we get into, you know, a several dial approach towards an actual decision maker. Um, you know, I think, I think there are some things that are super important uh, that you have your target market defined. Um, you mentioned niches. I'm a, I'm a huge believer in that, being able to come with an expertise in that particular niche and know the chair they sit in and understand what they're faced with on a daily basis. Um, we work from an exclusivity perspective, only one in, in each market. So that enhances the appointment setting script. That's, that's actually how we've been in my entire 28 years in a niche, only working with one in a particular market. So when I'm on the phone um, in the scripting, it is really, hey, I'm, I'm running our market development process in the Cleveland area. And we're here within the next couple of weeks talking to the best people in uh, commercial cleaning. Uh, you happen to be one of them based on my research coming into the market. And, you know, from our hundred clients that are around the country, they said, when we come to Cleveland, we got to talk to you. And I, I, so I come from that perspective and, and, and really build up why we're calling them, who they are and why they need to meet with us pretty quickly because it's, coming and then it's gone and want to give them uh, the opportunity to take a look at what's coming to their market, provide feedback and decide whether or not they want to partner. Uh, that, that's unique, but I do think that no matter what space you're in, uh, product or service, that there's a, a variation of that that you could do uh, that makes it easier to set the appointment and makes it easier uh, to increase your show rates. So when I was, and there's a great video that you did, it's like a 15 minute talk. I encourage people to check it out. Um, there's some components. I love to talk a little bit deeper about some of them, you know, the components of the sales script. Um, obviously, you know, people don't love doing this, right? That's why they hire you. Um, but here's some of the things that they are doing it now. You talk about the wow, you talk about part of the club, you talk about exclusivity, accessing someone through an influencer scarcity, and then selling the appointment. Um, talk about the wild wow part. So I, you, you have to get their attention clearly right up front. And so I've got to figure out what my statement is going to be that makes somebody want to listen. And um, before even doing that, I, I always say, hey, I know I got you in the middle of running your business, so I'll be brief, right? Just pardon the interruption and just letting them know that I'm going to get through what I'm about ready to say very quickly. And then the reason I'm calling is X and, and that's where I, I need to be pretty powerful. Um, you know, if I'm a managed service provider, that there are a lot of managed service providers these days. So why are you different? It's really about coming up with the differentiator and giving me a good reason why I'd want to talk to you now. Um, so I may happen to be a managed service provider that specializes in cybersecurity in the automotive industry, right? And then all of a sudden you've got my ear maybe a little bit more than it's just another managed service provider calling me. Um, so there's got to be something that makes me want to listen. And then uh, depending on the industry, there may be a particular case study as well. Something very quick, like, Hey, we're able to, I'm going to get it all wrong as far as cybersecurity goes, but we're, we're able to protect people's environments 27% more, or 
protect up, up time. People are up times, two times what it typically is because we happen to specialize in your industry and know what you go through. And, the, and then it's always a question. Tell me how you're handling your cybersecurity now. The, the part of the club is powerful, right? There's a FOMO involved. Um, what do you do as far as creating this club? Yeah. Um, so let's take one of our, our industries, roofing. Right? I think we have, I don't know, 102 commercial roofers around the country that we work with. Um, in our sales process, uh, we're, we're talking to them about our sales enablement capabilities and the process that will run on their behalf. But also a big part of it is we know your industry and we're plugged into some of the, the best players around the country. And when we get together with you on a monthly basis, uh, not, not only are we going to understand the problems you're facing on a daily basis, we're going to try to plug into that network and bring best practices and good ideas, things that other people are doing, you know, maybe you're in Des Moines, Iowa, and this person's in, you know, Kansas City, and uh, we we want to make sure to to share. Um, and then a big big part of that too is people like to share things that are working for them as well. They may not, they may like that more more than getting the ideas, and so we try to do a little bit of both and create a club, if you will. You know. Um... Selling the appointment you talk about, what do mistakes people make on sales calls um, when they aren't doing things, you know, that, I guess? Many pitching. Um, you know, there's, I'm just a firm believer in, I, I literally just yanked you out of the middle of what you're doing. And even if you say you've got a little bit of time now, I, you weren't prepared for me to call. You're not, we don't have a set time. You don't know me. You haven't done any research on me. Um, I may not know you the way, you know, like I should. And, and so I'm just a firm believer in actually calling that out. It's like, look, I, the only reason that I'm calling today is I'm trying to, you know, <laughs> shorten my interruption with you today, but it's important for us to get together within the next week week or so at a set time. Um, I, I just think that what happens is people get into many pitches. The worst case scenario is it's a sales enablement person that doesn't even know all the ins and outs of the sales presentation itself. And so now I'm many pitching and the prospect could be making a decision when I get off the phone to not show up based on what happened there. Um, or if I'm a salesperson setting my own appointments, uh, because I do know um, about the product or service, I may, you know, give in and give up a little bit of what I'm, I'm going to talk about next. And then when I get with you on that next time period, you as a prospect may feel like I've already talked about some of those things um, and, not, and I may not have your, your full attention and participation on the next meeting. I just think sell the appointment, overcome the objections of why you don't want to go into particular things now and why that meeting is for that and build up, you know, why others have found that it, it will be a good meeting to attend, which is super easy if you're in niches. You know, you may be calling somebody that's at the, the number one HVAC company in you know, the Bronx and they have been for years and why the hell do I want to talk to you? And uh, it's like, look, I get it. And you don't know who I am. And I'm calling you out of the blue. Uh, but the reason that you would want to talk to me is because we specialize in your industry because I hear that same thing from all the top players and all the other States. You know, I heard that before we got together, but then they gave me the 45 minutes. They looked at, at what our program has to offer and very quickly realized that they, that they could strengthen their lead and protect their lead. And, you know, that's why we should get together next Tuesday at two o'clock. Scott, how do you determine exclusivity for, do you do it via a certain mileage or radius when you're working with a company and you go in, you know, uh, to like the best or the biggest one in the Bronx and say, we weren't, you know, 
what do you say as far as exclusivity and how do you do that with your, your company? Um, <clears throat> it's usually to a target market. I, there are, I'd say 15, 15 or so markets around the country where we would run multiple programs. Like New York's a great example. You might have Manhattan and the Bronx and Queens and right. Um, but we may only run one, one program in Toledo, Ohio. Uh, most of them are one program markets. So when you're, but it when you have a lot to do with the number of companies that we need to be able to work the process. Yeah. When you're reaching out though, that is that part of what you say is like, we're going to be working with one company in this area. Yeah. And it could be you or one of your competitors. Yeah. 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 Uh, and, and calling out who you may have meetings set up with already. You have to do that in the right way. Um, yeah. it's, it's not a threat. It's just that <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of those industries are super competitive. And if they feel like other people uh, have committed to sitting down and having a discussion with you, then, then they're going to want to do the, yeah. the same just, just to be safe. I don't want to threat anyone in the Bronx, especially. No, no. Uh, um, um, so let's walk through, you know, when you're, when a company's working with you, what do you find the most effective? Because you have multiple people in different aspects of this process, right? Because you talk to the phone, you have email, you have LinkedIn. Um, how does it work? Walk me through it, how you do it with, with your company. And this is obviously essentially how you do it with other companies too. Um, well, how does what, sorry. Oh, the does, multiple people you say are handling different aspects of the reach out. Okay. Um, well, I, I'm just a firm believer in uh, a person not being super great at wearing multiple hats. So we try to specialize. So over here in a 30 day implementation process, we'll have multiple people um, doing different things. Um, one group where they exclusively build target markets and deal with data. Another group that may be <clears throat> um, writing email content. Uh, if we're, we're going to build a website for you, you know, there's a group over here that, that specifically writes web pages and SEO content and deals with that infrastructure. Um, we have uh, you know, we do email campaigns for people and we actually have people that work in boxes and those, those folks are separate from people that um, are actually making outbound phone calls. Um, and, and with that, I'll use, I'll use an example of why I would want uh, specialization. If I am uh, working in boxes and making outbound phone calls, I'm probably going to prefer working the inboxes more than making the outbound phone calls. And so, you know, we may not be doing exactly what we need to be doing from a phone outreach perspective. So we've got different specialties and then they follow a very tight plan and, and all those things, you know, come together in, in, in our process to, to build an effective pipeline. How do you coordinate those if, you know, different people, one person's maybe reaching out via phone, another person's reaching out via email, another person or division of the company may be reaching out via social media or LinkedIn? So um, we, our entire organization's on Salesforce. Uh, and we, we use Salesforce in such a heavy way that we actually started another company doing Salesforce consulting to help people with uh, integrations and implementations when they decide to to invest in that platform. Um, but we have everybody tied in, uh, processes tied in, and and uh, just run run from that. Were you considering any others before you made the decision for Salesforce? Um, you know, we brought in a, a smaller organization towards the beginning. They had gold mine. We changed that in a hurry. Um, the acquisition that we did most recently, the email marketing company, they are 
heavy in HubSpot. Um, I will say that we are converting most of those folks to Salesforce, but we are using or, or leaving some things in the outbound sales in HubSpot. What, I'd, say, I'd say those two are the players, quite frankly, HubSpot and Salesforce. Um, I want to go back to the volume, right? I mean, the I know we were talking before we hit record. I mean, you want to or do schedule over a thousand appointments, new appointments a month as a company. Um, and one of those things that you do is just, you said, ruling people out to see if it's a fit or not. What are some of the things that you train the team on to when they're doing the outbound calls or emails to determine, you know, do you want to spend time there or not? Yeah. Um, so that number is for our internal sales team. Um, we want to make sure that at the end, to keep up with our goals for this year, that we have 1,100 held pitches. Now, in order to do that, you know, we've got a bunch of people making outbound calls um, to find out what maybe we can't find out. We've built an unbelievable database. We put millions into it, but still at the end of the day, there's no perfect data. And so there's some outreach necessary to determine whether or not we want to put them uh, on the phone with one of our sales reps. So um, there are a lot of things that we do from a, a data perspective first. Uh, you know, we've got several different listing sources and then we have uh, three different target markets for the, the, the companies that we have. And then we take all of our campaign data um, and, and, and we put that together. So if we're coming into a particular market, we can see uh, who usually picks up the phone, who responds to email, who we interact with on social. So there is a lot of things we do from a target market perspective to be as smart as we can before we go at it. Um, and, and then once, once we're there, it's like if I'm sending email, I'm, I'm, I know that I'm hitting multiple people within an organization because the decision-making process isn't always the same. So I may be hitting the CEO or the president and the CRO or the CMO. Um, if, if I'm making phone outreach, I've got all that data and, and I'm running tracks on different titles until I determine who does make the decision. And then with each client, we figure out what their qualifiers are. You know, if they need a certain square footage or, you know, they don't want to work with anybody that's less than the next number of desktops, or, or if the company needs to be a couple million dollars in revenue minimum or have 100 employees plus, uh, we get those differentiators in the implementation process, work that into our, you know, our fact finding and our, and our sales scripts, if you will, and make sure that we're uh, qualifying. Yeah, so once, once we do put uh, somebody on the phone or a sales presentation with our internal team or with one of our external clients, uh, it's qualified first to, to meet what their specifications are. I want to talk about um, retaining, hiring A players. What do you do for training, right? I'm sure, and you've talked about this in one of your talks, which is there's a low barrier to entry of, if you want to be a salesperson, you know, mm -hmm. um, you, anyone could do it, but the people that last do ongoing training, they do ongoing education. Um, what, what kind of things do you do with the team? Yeah. So we, from a training perspective, when you, when you first get here, there's a two week training class. Um, we've got, we have two training classes a, a month and there's usually 15 to 20 people in each one of those training classes. Um, and first and foremost, I would say the most important thing is to get the best person you possibly can up front, right? Cause it makes everything else that much easier. But within our training, uh, the first two week training, it is a lot on how to work our Salesforce processes, who we are as an organization, what our mission and values are. Uh, and then there is uh, towards the end, last three or 
four days, some specific training around the industries that they're going to serve, um, the clients that they're going to end up picking up. After that, though, we're a big believer in ongoing professional development. And so it's actually uh, mandatory that, that somebody has at least an hour a week um, of ongoing professional training. We do best practices. Uh, so in account management or sales or content or art, uh, there are weekly best practices, so they can certainly get their training there. Uh, but we also use Litmus as a platform where we've loaded all kinds of uh, content that they can go out and, and, and follow different tracks. And, and then uh, what happens is we've got uh, kind of our version of, of, uh, of martial arts, if you will, but you earn belts for, for the number of hours or the points that you've received for training. And the goal is to become a black belt. And um, when we have meetings, we, we talk about it. We make it a big deal. You know, who's on top, who's a black belt, who's just pouring into to growth. Um, I think that, that it happens naturally here because we're, you know, we're growing quickly. And one of the reasons we attract you know, kids right out of college in the first place is because they can come here into one position, but have 20 or 30 different tracks that they could go down. And as long as we keep our growth up, you know, they've got a, a, a lot of different bites they can take from one apple. They can stay here and grow their career in, in a lot of different ways. And, and because of that, uh, a lot of them are pretty hungry and self-motivated to go get the training yeah no i love the earn the belts right there's a gamification and uh there what are some of the resources or books that you recommend or maybe you used um that are kind of in the curriculum it could be you know um a book or a resource that you recommend um gosh there are so many it's interesting that you said that we're putting a 12-month track together for directors and we aligned it with with books um i'll send you that list but i'll tell you about uh, one book that we hand to every new hire and it's called the one thing and i had the author on my podcast yeah did you yeah, yeah. um i love it i you know i did so much reading in the past I, i'm guilty of maybe getting content via podcast or 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 video or YouTube now, but this one thing book just brings a lot of principles together. And what I like is is that uh, you know this is the easiest way to explain it. We all build success lists, and then and then drill down that list to the things that are maybe the easiest to do that day, and then hold over the most important thing. And you know if you were just to do that number one most important thing that day it probably impacts 80 percent of the list anyway and it just takes commitment to do that you don't always want to do the hardest thing first so that book highlights what that domino is in your, your personal life and professional spiritual and if you're committed to figuring out what that is and doing those things on a daily basis that's the definite definition of you know someone still shooting for success or maybe somebody that is being successful. I love that. Any favorites in the kind of sales category? Um, you're going to laugh at me. A lot of people do, uh, maybe not, but I, I love Jeffrey Gittimer. <laughs> I just, it's easy to read and simple. And the reason that I, that I do is because you can take it in bite size. And I think it's good for salespeople, especially on their entry in. And then he's added a lot of kind of ongoing content, um, the, you know, daily stuff that people can get access to if you're a salesperson. Uh, I like the I like his energy. Uh, I like the books and how easy they are to take in. And I know that I can get most people to be okay grabbing grabbing one of those books and getting through it pretty quickly and picking up a nugget or two you said you know obviously you know part of the reason why you have a successful company is 
you have a great team, you have a great company and, and team members, and it kind of starts with the input uh, with the hiring process. Um, what does that look like? Um, our hiring process? Yeah. Yeah. So it used to look one way. I will, I will tell you that it used to look one way and it looks a little bit differently now. Our, we used to go straight out of college. Right. Got to have a college degree. Um, maybe it has to be these couple of degrees. And these are the schools we're focused on. And it's evolved because um, we have not really proven out that that person's more successful than the person that is, you know, maybe five years into their career and want to reinvent themselves. Or maybe they couldn't go to college for whatever reason, maybe they couldn't um, afford it. So now they're 10 years deep in work experience and bringing like a hunger to this place and lots of experiences. So what we do now is uh, both, um, we, we are connected to about 20 different universities and uh, we're in touch with their career departments. We have career fairs at probably half of them. Uh, we have what we call a college ambassador on five different campuses that's, you know, they're responsible for going and talking to the professors and shooting over the fraternities and sororities and just building up the name and the brand and trying to get people to come and, and work here. Uh, but then we're just working just as hard at trying to find uh, people that want to reinvent themselves or people that... Um, didn't go to college, but have incredible work experience. And uh, we've got a pretty sizable recruiting department and we're probably doing some of the things that everybody else does in the way of posting ads and doing things on LinkedIn and making calls and um, our recruiting actually for ourselves, because we have to recruit 30 ish new people a month to keep up with a little bit of our phone turnover. Cause not everybody loves it. Right. Um, and then our growth as well, uh, because we had to recruit that many people, we actually started a, a, a recruiting division and now um, do recruiting for clients. Do you allow remote or does it have to be in the St. Louis area? Um, we, if, if you are outside of, I believe it's, 50 miles, um, then you are allowed to do remote. We have some employees that are in different spots around the country. Maybe they started here and moved there. Maybe, maybe during COVID things happened, right? Where people said, I'm going to live somewhere different, do something different. Um, if you come here um, and live by here, what you do is earn your way to a day a week. Um, in the first six months. And then by the time you get to the end of the first year, you get two days a week out. And then we just, we rest at that. So in office, three days out of office two. Yeah. Talk about, sure. yeah. For companies like that, who are still trying to navigate this kind of hybrid culture, um, talk about the, your thoughts and importance on having them come in. Obviously it's important for you to have them come in. A couple of days a week at least. So, gosh, if you're in the <clears throat> LinkedIn landscape, there are people just are mean to each other about this, right? It's like, I don't understand why you can't set principles up and say, as long as someone's doing the work, why would you care? And then some people are like, well, it's about collaboration. I, it really depends on your organization. For us, when we have a lot of new people that may, well, I'll just take the people right out of college, for instance, they're coming right out of college into something brand new that they don't understand. They're being faced, they're facing rejection all day long, like to put that person immediately in their house for five days. They don't even know how to use Salesforce yet. It, you know, and then even when they get a little bit better at using the process and, and, you know, doing the work at home, maybe you have a down day and you're not surrounded by others that are having success. For us, the collaborate, like 
the education that we can give somebody quicker development in the beginning is important. And then the collaboration and just what we do, if someone's having a down day, it's just, it, it's easier to be surrounded by others to, to pick them up. Um, I am not saying somebody can't work from home. I am saying most people can't. Some people can, most people can't. They think they can, but they're, they're, they're not great at it. I like the hybrid. We do have good days at home, but I firmly believe it's because they come in, get that energy, they collaborate, then they go home, they got a full day where they don't have meetings and they're set and they, they have a good day at home. I, I like the hybrid. Let's talk about, you bring up a good point because there's a lot of rejection people are facing with this, uh, whether it's email, phone. And you, you talked about this a little bit in your talk that you gave about the mindset. How do you reset your mindset when you're going through? And there's little rejections, whether someone's in sales or not, or just a lot of rejection, depending on the day. How, how do you reset your mindset or how do you have your team reset their mindset when they're facing all this rejection? That's a good question. I, I, have, I think I have two answers to that. No, number one, um, and, and it's kind of unique to the individuals. You, you have to find out what works for you just to, to keep your mind right and, and stay motivated. And that's being healthy and, you know, having your routine and in the morning or what you eat or how you sleep or what you drink or who you surround yourself with. And there are a lot of ways to go about that and a lot of different opinions, but you got to be doing the work to show up in the morning feeling as, as good as you can feel to start from there. I, I find that if they can connect to the client they're serving and the purpose, then it's easier to break through the rejection. So what I mean by that is, uh, you know, we talk a lot here about really at the, at the core, what we care about most is impacting lives through building sales pipelines, which sounds, sounds kind of goofy, but, you know, if a business is set from a new meetings perspective, they can feel comfortable about growing or at least staying their same size, their employees, their employee growth, we're impacting that. So if, so just as an overall mission, if I'm on the phone doing that hard work, if I can think that I'm impacting lives, I may change the business that I'm serving, then, then I, I don't know, the person that swears at me or hangs up on me, that doesn't hit me as much. And then the other thing in that is I think that people get into sales and they make it something that it's not. Um, that like a lot of people say, well, I'm not, I don't have that kind of personality or I'm not a salesperson. And uh, although all the, they've been doing some of those things, we're asking them to do their entire life, like negotiating to the front of the line, talking mom out of the car keys, you, you know, getting their friends to go there versus, you know, where their friends might want to, you know, this party versus that party. People naturally are doing that or people are naturally connecting others. And then they get into sales and they make it this thing. So if they think, look, I, I'm serving my client, the client needs me, and I'm just trying to find people that my client may be able to help and uh, connect them, and maybe both of their businesses are better. You know, if, I've got, if I'm thinking about that, it's easier to, to, to do the work. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. You know, a lot of times the lifeblood of a business is a predictable sales pipeline, right? And if they're thinking of it as that, of helping that, growing that company, make, you know, and securing, you know, creating security for that company, I could, I could see that for sure. Uh, that one person hanging up is not that big of a deal. Right. right. Um, talk about the niches. You know, you, you serve, and it's important that you served um, certain niches. How did you come to the niches that you ultimately decided on? Well, in, in, in the onset, um, you know, when you're starting, I think that <laughs> you take whatever business you can get, right? Uh, especially in marketing. 
Uh, so we did that in the beginning, like I'll build a website or, you know, I'll send some direct mail or I'll do that radio commercial. Um, but then you start growing up a little bit and figuring out what you do best. Uh, we make made products, turned our marketing into products. And then we said, okay, what is, what's working the best? So in the beginning we picked one or two. And then the way that that evolves is we'll get referrals from clients. So we have this quote unquote other bucket of clients, if you will, that aren't necessarily core niches in our sales department yet, but we find out, Hey, in our fulfillment process, wow, we can, we can do a good job in that niche. And then that rolls into our sales enablement department. We design territories and then all of a sudden, uh, you know, those success stories are in our salespeople's hands and, and we're working that new niche. I'm a really big believer in it, though. You know, we mentioned before we hit record, Scott, about, you know, obviously you can continue to grow um, and you're putting infrastructure in place so you can handle that growth. So what does that look like right now? How are you putting in infrastructure? Yeah, so we um, we're just shy of 60 million and wrapping the year up and, and, you know, we really wanted to put the pedal down. We really felt like we had uh, our products designed and how we fulfill. Um, nobody has it all the way figured out. You're always improving, but, you know, we really feel like we know how to fulfill our products and we were ready to really step up growth. So we picked um, uh, $80 million number, which is going to be our, our biggest growth number, $20 million in, in one year. And, um, you know what that so what that meant was we need to hire more people so we've got to build out our recruiting department um, you know we need to be able to implement a larger number of clients we've got to pull some people over to implementation you know we have to write more content you, you know we have to pull more lists so we we had pretty much modeled out what an end individual person can do in each one of those areas. And then we looked at our growth and did the backwards math and put the people in place so that we can make sure to actually do things the right way. Growth is a, a problem a lot of times for, for companies. And God knows over the last 28 plus years, we've made plenty of mistakes. And I think one of the most important things we've learned is, is if you're going to grow, um, you know, you, you, you got to, plan it out and and back into it and do it the right way and really model out what people you need when you need it and have that plan in place not just grab 20 million dollars and be running as fast as you can trying to hire people after the fact you gotta you, you have to have it done beforehand what's cool about what you do scott is that when you bring them on and they're helping your company it's similar things they'd be doing for the other companies. So when you're training them, it's it seems like it's helping. It will help your fulfillment also because that's what they're doing for you. Um, I you know one of the ways you've grown is through acquisitions. So I love for you to talk about and you structured them in a little bit in some unique ways. Um, talk about I mean one of the acquisitions and how you structured it. Yeah. So. Um... We were, we were running up against a, a company that, that was in town here. Um, and they were doing, like we were doing at that point, a lot of our, our mainstay was the phone outreach and they were doing lead gen hundred percent or primarily through uh, email marketing and uh, kind of going after some of the same niches we were running into each other and, and so, you know, for a couple of years, I would actually get together with the, that gentleman in town here and we'd just talk about strategy and, and we had a lot of the same philosophy and it just made sense for us. Uh, he needed to add phone calls and we needed to be better at, at email. And so it was just a sweet spot for us. And they had a bunch of clients and they'd done a nice job. They, they had, you know, 18 plus million dollars in annual revenue. And 
And uh, so we put it together and, and I, w- we had to go at it creatively. Um, didn't want to just, you know, pay uh, X amount up, up front. And so what we did is, is we creatively put a deal together where Jeff got to, to take some money off the table, a nice chunk. And then he got two more chunks over the next two years based on performance. And then he got, and then in doing that, if all of that was hit, then he actually got shares in our overall organization. So for us, it wasn't as much up front. And it wasn't as much up front for him either. But if he did a good job, um, I, it, it, it was a way better deal for him, you know, over the long haul. And then, of course, because he performed, it's a good deal for us as well. So uh, not everybody's willing to do that. You know, people might want their money now, uh, especially if they're getting together with a group of people that they don't necessarily know. I think it helped that we'd been having discussions for a couple of years leading up to that uh, for us to be on the same page. But a creative deal like that worked out for all of us. How do you navigate integration? of the teams in the company? Um, I wish I could say that, that uh, I had that perfected. Um, There's different schools to thought. I know when people are doing roll-ups, a lot of times they just leave them alone. Right. And uh, in this scenario, because the email was becoming such a substantial part of our overall product, we really made the decision to just integrate everything. And it was a little painful. There was a difference in the cultures, uh, you know, a tiny bit. And, um, you know, we just, we put some managers together and and talked about overlaps and and just tie-ins and vision and what it could be. And, and then actually last year, our theme for the year was one team, one dream. And it's because we really were still two families uh, acting a little bit in a different way. And, and we, we had to break down the walls uh, and, and do things differently and get groups of people together and become one family. And when we did that and established one culture, it really worked. We changed some of our our value statements to incorporate, you know, some of that companies that, you know, which made them feel good. We incorporated some best practices um, and just made it a focus. And then we took some key people at both organizations and had them be over, you know, bring them over to the other company or have them be over groups that maybe served both. We just had to blur the lines. It's hard though. And if I were to do it over again, I think that I would have just ripped the Band-Aid off right away. If I'm going to integrate, I'm going to do it, and I'm going to do it right now, and I'm going to do it quickly. Uh, if I'm not, and I'm going to leave it separate, I'm going to do that. Scott, first of all, I have one last question, but thank you. Thanks for sharing your expertise and knowledge. It's really amazing what you've done with your company and also being a staple in, in St. Louis in general. Um, I want to point people to your website. Um, they can go to abstract MG that's a B S T R a K T M G.com to learn more. Um, and obviously you hear their, their hiring. So, or if you have, uh, you know, if you are a possible partner for them, you know, contact them, uh, if you, you know, serve adjacent niches and don't do what they, what they do. So, the last question I had is uh, I want to tell people to check out your show, the growth show podcast um, and talk about how you're utilizing the podcast. Yeah. Thank you. Um, it's called the Grow show uh, stories from the front lines. And we really wanted to put it together for two reasons. Um, first, we wanted to put it together for our clients Um you know, we've learned some things along the way in growing our organization, and we wanted to pass along some of those best practices to them. You know, a lot of our clients are uh, starting up or, you know, a couple million dollars, and they've 
got growth ahead of them and we've been through some of that before and we just wanted to make it a little bit easier. And uh, another thing we wanted to do with the show is train our people internally in our organization. Um, we've got 50 for 50 segments. So one of them's 50 for 50 and it's just how to set up an organization for growth. You know, one's 50 for 50 and just sales tips and one's mining for growth or lead generation best practices. But we want our people, you know, internally to, to know and to grow in those areas. And then they're better consultants for our clients as well when they take that knowledge in and go. And then uh, from a prospecting perspective, we do a lot of outreach. And as we're connecting with people on, on LinkedIn, uh, or sending emails, making phone calls, whatever it may be. They're not all saying yes right now. And so we wanted to be able to provide good nurture content. Hopefully they plug in, take a listen. They like some things that they hear. And next time when we're trying to get a hold of them, uh, you know, they're warmed up and ready to have a meeting or, or, or they may even call us if, if they like what they hear. Love it. Scott, I want to be the first one to thank you. Everyone check out abstract with the KMG.com to learn more and check out the their growth show. Uh, thanks, Scott. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand.